Okay. Hopefully you all can still hear me. I've not done this uh, format before, so all good? Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started here. Thank you so much for being here today. This is um, a new initiative that we're doing here at the Pomerantz Career Center called Industry Insights, which is a series of employer panels that we're hosting this academic year. Um, so we very much appreciate you supporting and being with us today. My name is Abby Case. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a career coach here at the PCC, and I also work with our employer outreach team. Um, so I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves here in a second, but uh, first just want to explain some of the logistics of the webinar. So we are recording this session, um, so if you have to leave early or if you know people who might want to uh, view this webinar later, you can absolutely let them know about it because we will have this up on our website soon um, so that people can still get the information even if they couldn't attend in person. We do have a few set questions that I'll ask everybody to answer, and then we will save some time at the end for um, audience questions. Now, um, all audience members, um, apart from our panelists, are automatically muted, so you won't be able to unmute and ask, but we do have a question and answer function, and you can go ahead and um, put your questions in there. And um, if you want to ask them ahead of time, feel free to go ahead and use that feature, uh, but we won't ask the panelists those questions until we get towards the end of the um, webinar. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Like I said, um, so panelists, I will ask you some questions related to um, educational background and everything. So if we could just um, maybe briefly go through what uh, your, your name, job title and where you're coming to us from, where you work, and maybe just like maybe a brief overview of um, what your job entails. So I will go ahead and start with Emily, if you wouldn't mind. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Vetter. I am the Assistant Director of Academic Advising in the School of Neuroscience at Virginia Tech. Um, I am an Iowa alum. I graduated with my bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Iowa in 2016. <laughs> Gosh, like gotta count back the years. <laughs> and then I did a minor in music and Spanish. And then I got my master's degree in higher and post-secondary education from Arizona State University in 2017. So I've been in academic advising for the past seven years full time. I started out as a full-time professional advisor at Arizona State before coming to, to Virginia Tech and serving as the assistant director. And as the assistant director, I do a mix of um, still advising students, but I also have more administrative duties and supervising a team of two full-time advisors. Excellent. Molly, will you go next? Hello, everyone. My name is Molly Barrett. Um, I graduated from the U of Iowa in 2015 um, with my BA in psychology and a minor in human relations um, and studio arts. Um, I then went on to the University of Northern Iowa for my master's in clinical mental health counseling um, and graduated there in 2018. Um, since then, I've been working for an agency within the state of Iowa called Heart and Solutions. Um, I worked my way up in a, for a couple of years in the therapy department, um, and I am now clinical director and a licensure supervisor um, for uh, mental health providers within the state working towards their licensure. Um, oh my gosh, yeah, I think that's that's about it. Great, then we'll have um, Avery and then Monica. Hi, everybody. My name is Avery Deasy. Um, I currently work at Rosecrans Jackson Centers. It's um, a rehab inpatient facility. I have a men's unit of 18, and I also have an adolescent unit that holds 18. Um, we're not always there, but that's a little bit longer of a program. Um, a little bit about me. I got my bachelor's from Morningside University in 2018. <laughs> Never remember those years. Um, 2018. Um, it was in, technically it's a Bachelor's of Arts, but I specialized in counseling psychology and sociology. Um, and then I got my master's at University of South Dakota, um, and that was in social work. So I'm currently working on getting my independent license, uh, my LASW. Um, so lots of, lots of opportunities at both schools. So I'm just, I'm happy to be here. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Monica Brockway. I am a supervisor at Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services. We are a state agency um, under the Iowa Works umbrella and that is um, under the Department of Labor. 
So um, I have been here for about 12 and a half years. Um, I supervise a team of 12 and we serve approximately eight to 900 folks, um, dis people with disabilities and helping them navigate employment barriers. I am also an Iowa alum, graduated in 2009 with a master's in social work and then went on to get my MSW um, and then did some post um, graduate work with VCU and and learned all about rehab counseling. So um, I get to supervise some rehab counseling grad students at Iowa every semester, and that's been a total blast. I have. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, we do have one more panelist who might be joining us uh, a little bit later, just having trouble getting into the meeting. Um, so just so everyone knows, if someone randomly pops in, that might happen. Uh, so yeah, we'll go ahead and get started with the first question now. Uh, several of you kind of alluded to either where you went to school or your program, but if you wouldn't mind kind of sharing your educational background journey and how that has contributed to your current career path. Um, and we'll actually start in the reverse order. So Monica, if you don't mind starting. Sure. Well, um, just having, you know, the social work BA and that foundation really just gave me kind of um, a very broad view of the helping career professions. And then through that, you know, is able to um, have some really neat opportunities to intern and job shadow and build kind of a network you know, at Iowa, and I felt really confident kind of in what what I wanted to do next and, and what I wanted to learn and um, and learned a lot about what I didn't know and what interests me. So I, I think it was just um, really important to my career development to be able to access, you know, the instructors that I had and um, go from there. Thank you. Avery, will you go next? Um, yeah, so I think uh, for one, I did. I said I did my bachelor's in counseling psychology. So when I got done with my bachelor's, the biggest question too was, do I need to keep going to school? Um, everybody at the end of the bachelor's was asking that. So I had a uh, professor at Morningside who really pushed me in the direction of social work, um, because just like Monica said, I think it's just a really broad. Um, Le there's all kinds of levels, right? So right now I'm in leadership, but I can take the therapy route. I can work for the state. I can work on policies and community outreach and all of those. There's just so many options. So um, that kind of geared me in that direction. I think the other important piece from um, just the schooling piece was practicums and internships, um, taking advantage of kind of like Monica said, learning what I didn't know, even what I didn't like. Um, I've had internships where I was like, oh, this is not what I want to be be doing for the long run. Um, and it's the best experience to know that because then I don't have a career path that that I know I'm not going to enjoy. So um, definitely those pieces were really important for me. Thank you for sharing. You're so Molly. muted, sorry. Yeah, you're on mute, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, my first couple of years at Iowa was a lot of my my psychology focus. Um, so I knew I wanted to do something, but wasn't quite sure, something in the field, but wasn't sure. Um, really, when I started taking my human relations courses, I came into the university already kind of working um, with like about a semester of credits out of the way. Um, and so I was able to kind of experiment with both um, minors in a way of something that I really enjoyed, which is studio arts, but also being able to start that human relations minor, which got me into the therapy and kind of counseling world. Um, when meeting with professors and talking about future options, um, I knew that like you and I's program was going to be a great fit and, and my family's from that area. Um, and so being able to get into the master's program there and work um, just as, as Avery was saying to the intern and the practicum um, experiences really get to show you what's going to work for you and what isn't going to work for you. That is all about the learning phase. Um, so it was wonderful to graduate and get into the job I am now and tell my supervisor who's still my supervisor like, hey, I don't want to do this forever, but I would love to do leadership and, and have the opportunity to grow in that path as well has been um, awesome. Great, and then Emily. 
So pretty much all higher education professionals will tell you that um, this is a profession that we found. We did not go into college saying we were going to be, I'm sure Abby can attest as well. I, you know, I didn't say go into college saying I was going to be an academic advisor or a career coach or anything like that. Um, and it's something I more found along the way through my experiences in undergrad. I was very involved in the student affairs side of things, particularly fraternity and sorority life. And my mom, I remember saying, you know, her saying to me, I know you were kind of interested initially in doing like psychology therapy counseling, but you're really into this and you really enjoy it. And that's what you're dedicating a lot of your time to rather than, you know, maybe looking for psychology therapy experiences. Um, I fortunately have a cousin who works in higher education administration as well. So I was able to talk to her and that's how I decided just to kind of go for it. And I'm like, you know what? I really enjoy this. I can see myself doing it. I have a why, why I want to do this, why I want to support other students. Um, and so that's how I ended up going to get my master's degree um, for most most roles and master's is pretty typically required in, in the higher ed field. Yes, I can relate to that. Um, anyone interested in working in higher ed, you don't really go into college thinking about it, but FYI, you can do this um, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, all right, so we'll go on to the next question, um, which, and I know you're not all representing like quite the same industry, but kind of um, helping in counseling generally, or if you wanna talk um, kind of specifically in your particular roles, what trends you're seeing, that's totally fine. Um, so the question is, what are some of the most significant trends currently shaping your industry? Um, and this time, how about we start with Molly? Sure, thank you. Oh my gosh. Um, 2024, a few years past lockdown COVID, a huge significant trend was telehealth, right? Um, so the expansion of teletherapy and use of those digital tools, um, huge. A lot of times in counseling programs, um, at least a few years ago, uh, telehealth was kind of talked about for a couple minutes and as it's a thing, um, but that was about it. Um, and so really getting to retrain myself um, to meet with my clients, my staff members, um, absolutely was, was a big trend. Um, and so we're not even seeing that just in training our providers, we're seeing that across uh, reaching clients in rural areas, being able to um, offer services to people that we wouldn't be able to before, um, insurance, also with that, being able to talk with them about what is beneficial and that teletherapy um, does have results. Um, so yeah, at least in, in the therapy side, that's been the biggest one so far. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing that um, kind of that uh, shift in online stuff, um, but especially in the healthcare field for sure. Uh, so Avery, if you'll go ahead and go next. Yeah, sure. Um, so the last four years I've been doing mostly inpatient with adolescents. My men's unit has recently opened. So my brain instantly goes there um, with a lot of the same stuff that Molly's talking about and also with COVID um, because a lot of kids were pulled out of schools. Um, they were homeschooling um, or not schooling. <laughs> they weren't going to school at all. Um, so there was a lot of changes with that, with them being able to get resources. Um, the other thing we're seeing here at Rosecrans is we're primary substance use, um, but lately that's not enough. Right. And I think for a long time that hasn't been enough, but there's a new trend starting with co-occurring. Um, it's not just the substance use. It's the resources. It's the housing. It's family connections. It's mental health, um, med management, all of those things combined. So our company is really working on incorporating all of those pieces to help the entire person. Um, and I think that's the best trend right now um, and also the biggest right now. If you don't mind going next. I'm sorry, you cut out there. Was that me, Abby? Okay. Yes. I just heard the E at the end. I was like, okay, Monica, not Monica, me. Um, yeah, so obviously, definitely, yeah, COVID and how it's been affecting students. I would say um, in higher education, a lot of us are figuring out really how to communicate better with Generation Z. Um you know, and and you all, Generation Z out there in, in the um, audience, you know, you've had to face significant challenges that we never had to. And there's a lot of significant 
cultural differences just in the way the world is now and how you all were raised compared to how we were raised. So I found um, a lot of it now is we really, as advisors and higher education professionals, have to really model the way for students, kind of show them how they can do these things, how they can advocate for themselves, how they can be proactive. Um, and demonstrate that. So kind of the whole saying, you know, you if you teach a man to fish, you can he can fish for a lifetime. So definitely more modeling the way as opposed to things that I would think are common sense. You know, we have to kind of explain to students, this is how it works. This is what we do. Um, so adjusting to that and adapting to that across multiple generations of higher education professionals. All right, and we'll end with you for this one, Monica. Sure. Um, I, you know, the trend that I've seen in the last four, four years really has been um, on opportunities for professional specialization and investment in that professional development. And the reason that's so important is because we're we're seeing a, a higher acuity, higher level of need for people that are coming into services. So um, our agency has really leaned into that and allowed for um, people to get certified in various things. So assistive technology, benefits planning, motivational interviewing, um, ADA coordinator, uh, just things in special um, specialization areas where I can call someone who has gone through training and is you know, at the top of the field in a certain specialization and and get a consult with them. And I think that is really neat because um, the opportunities are endless. And so what I would say to students who are thinking about going into this field, don't be afraid to let somebody know what you're really interested in, because there's probably a training for it and there's probably an agency need for it. Okay, so we did have our fifth panelist just join. Um, so one second. Caleb, are you able to hear us slash use your mic and camera? Okay, maybe not. Um, all right, well, we'll jump into the next question and then um, Caleb, feel free to chime in if you can hear us and are able to respond. If not, no worries. Uh, I understand technology is not always our friend. It's another thing we've learned through the pandemic. All right, so uh, moving on to the next question is what's, and some of you have kind of talked about this a little bit, what's the biggest challenge or maybe one of the biggest challenges working in a helping and counseling related role? And how can aspiring professionals prepare to address this challenge? And I'll say um, anyone who wants to chime in first, that's fine. And we can kind of pop more from there. Um, I can start with something. Uh, one thing that I thought about for this question was sometimes client willingness. So we're going into the profession because we have passion for it, for people, for helping, um, for making a difference. And sometimes clients are very resistant to that um, in all of the levels of the field. Um, so understanding our own self-awareness, our own triggers, um, our own needs and taking care of ourselves because sometimes the clients aren't there with us, right? They're not ready for it yet. Um, and even if they are, it's a super difficult journey for them as well. So we're there to walk it with them, but not take it all in also. So learning our own um, boundaries and our own um, capabilities as professionals. I echo everything that Avery said in terms of how it also relates to advising students. You know, we often kind of act, even though we are not counselors and we tell them that, we kind of sometimes act in this weird intermediate, intermediary role of helping them through their struggles and coming up with solutions and things like that. Um, so I would say on the higher education side, one of the challenges I see with a lot of students is follow through. Even with my student workers, I feel like I'm giving a lot of reminders. And so it's really kind of teaching them and training them how to be more independent without the reminders. So still modeling the way, but at what point are you going to kind of let that, let that go? And they have to be intrinsically motivated. 
Um, on the administrative side, you know, depending where you're at and the who you work with at the university or college or wherever you're at, um, one thing that one that's the thing that's been a challenge for me, especially in an assistant director role, working closer with faculty, is um, sometimes you do have to work with difficult faculty um, that, even though they have PhDs. They may not have common sense. We'll say it. Um, and you know, you know more about certain things in your role than they might know. Um, so it's really about picking and choosing your battles and being OK with the fact that, you know, things may happen that you might not like. They might have the final say on something that you don't agree with. And I'm still working on this personally with new leadership in our school, letting our you know, director of undergrad programs, if he makes a decision that I'm like, eh, that's not really a good idea. I have to be OK with that. If the dominoes fall and things crash and burn, it's on him and not me. And he's going to have to deal with the repercussions. And that can be really hard when we don't want it to negatively impact the students just because that's that's how we are. We're, we're programmed that way. You know, we can see the future consequence, even though they may not see it. And it's kind of the whole like, I told you so. I see a mug that says I told you so <laughs> kind of thing, but definitely picking and choosing your battles and being OK with it um, and being OK when things might not out work out the way you want them to. Absolutely. I can go, but I don't know if Caleb was able to. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah, Caleb, there. you have a hand raised, so. Yeah, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, maybe that will work. I tried to make you a presenter. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, so, so sorry about that technology. Um, no worries but, at all. Um, sorry that it wasn't working out for you. Um, actually, if you don't mind, um, just kind of briefly introducing we already had everyone else um, introduce themselves so if you don't mind kind of introducing uh, your name where you're coming from what you do there um, real briefly and then if you want to respond to this question as well that's great yeah 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 well i am uh here uh my name is caleb thomas and i am the executive director of simply nerdy and as we were filling it out the uh information i thought that this um was the best area that, that it would fall under. And Simply Nerdy is an anti-bullying brand. We uh, work together to help prevent bullying uh, really across the globe. And we have a specific um, clothing line that we've designed, um, which is uh, NERD, but NERD stands for Nice, Educated, Respectful, and Determined, it's something that's been copyright written. So only uh, we can use that and one of the things we were uh, hoping to do was get connected with students to be able to help and support the mission and help the mission continue to go uh, further. And so again, um, please, if you would just uh, repeat the question again. So sorry. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, so this question was, what's the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges working in a helping and counseling related role? And how can aspiring professionals prepare to address such challenges? Yeah, so I uh, also do have my assistant here, Shanita. And Shanita, it's kind of hard for her to get in the camera because I have a very short <laughs> uh, cord with uh, I'll try to apple. get in there. OK, okay. hi. <laughs> so I'll let Shanita yeah. introduce herself as well. OK, and again, my name is Shanita. Nice to see all of you guys. Um, I am the assistant uh, executive director for Simply Nerdy. Um, I am also have uh, counseling and a nursing background, so I use all those skills to help you know, when I'm writing blogs for, you know, the website for Simply Nerdy. And as Caleb has, you know, said, you know, it's about anti-bullying. And we know that bullying takes place in all formats and all environments, not just one from, you know, grade school, college, professionals, workplaces, and all those places. And so what we try to do is to make an awareness as well as uh, give information as well as 
um, how do we stop, how do we address bullying without things escalating, keeping people safe, using the four Bs of bullying. And so um, we have, oh, interacted with, you know, kids um, on the website. We've done a, a couple of movies, a little mini videos, and um, you can check that out as well. And um, it's one of those things that has been around since the 1700s when bullying sort of first became a, you know, a byword or what have you. And um, it has gone across the course around the world. And we know that unless we do something as my most recent blog, a new school year, and already I've heard of things happening on the school buses and things of that nature. And this is what we want to address. It's not just October, which is like anti-bullying month, but it is every yeah, right. month <laughs> is anti-bullying month. And so we try very hard to um, interact as well as um, make connections, which is one of the things we're doing today with you guys, and we appreciate it so much. And um, your ideas are bright, and um, you may have some new things as well for us that we can utilize and to help us to further the cause of what we're doing. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Okay, um, Caleb, did you want to answer the question? Okay, so um, again, uh, that was just a quick introduction. Give me the first part of it again. What makes it? Yeah, no problem. Um, what's the biggest challenge or maybe a big challenge that you face in a helping counseling related role? Um, and what advice would you have for aspiring professionals for facing uh, that challenge? The, the biggest challenge um, in the helping and counseling role, I would say, is really getting that help and that support, getting the awareness out there. As Shanita mentioned, she uh, is a nurse. I'm also a mental health therapist as well. So we kind of combine that um, information into what we are doing. Um, Another big thing is really, again, uh, extending out uh, really throughout the community, you know, um, working with some other individuals. Um, one of the big thing for us is trying to get to school, uh, which is pretty big. So we, um, are really trying to get again that support in there and really getting that awareness out i would say is one of the biggest concerns for us at least and i think for counseling from a counseling perspective is what she's looking at for these young folks going out today how can they how can they utilize their counseling skills nothing with the anti-bullying yeah focusing mainly on counseling. so so if it's more towards problems towards counseling yeah. Um, again, I would say, um, again, getting more awareness out there of, um, and this is kind of on the counseling aspect, it's still uh, taboo in many forms, um, especially in uh, the areas of uh, minorities and getting out there and knowing that it is okay to go and seek therapy. Yeah, I've said it better myself. Uh, very much appreciate that, trying to end that stigma. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Molly, I believe you might've been starting to say something if you wanna join in next. Oh, sure, sure. Um, and really just to kind of echo what's been said, um, the biggest challenge and, and things to prepare for as you go into your professional career, especially in a helping field, um, is your self-care practices. You know, regularly engaging in activities that replenish your energy, reduce your stress, um, and really allow you to um, regulate your own emotions, especially if it's um, in a in a close helping position um, where you might be meeting one-on-one -on -one with clients um, that you are able to learn your own mindfulness, your own cognitive um, behavioral strategies to avoid being potentially overwhelmed by client issues that may come in. 
Um, and with that too, seek your supervision and your support. Um, your fellow colleagues, your supervisors, especially in helping fields, um, depending on where you're at, are going to be there in order to uh, provide you with that support um, through maybe a difficult client or something that might be going on. so much. All right, uh, Monica, do you have anything you want to add to this one before we move on? Really, my my comments were almost the same as Molly's. Um, Self-care is so, so important. And I think self-care is a topic that is talked about a lot more now in helping professions than maybe it was when I was in school. Um, and please listen to it and please do it because uh, what I have learned is that it's it's really easy to to get out of touch um, with yourself and and you can start to take on the work. Um, and so it's our responsibility as professionals to do the work and um, self reflect and get the the care that we need so that we can show up every day the best version of ourselves. Um, we go into this profession because we have big hearts and we want to help people. We don't always think about the impact that the work can have. You know the highs and the lows. So um, very important. And can I add? Um... Self-care is important and at the same time, when it comes to clients and the issues that they come in with, we have to be like a blank slate. Let them write their story for us and we can actually decipher what's going on, how we can intervene, what interactions, what interventions we can take at any time with them, as well as the support that they need is so pertinent. And when they come, they can sometimes download <laughs> and you're not ready for all the other things that are attached to it. However, as a new professional going out into the work, you know, field, um, keeping an open mind, you know, everyone's problem is different, you know. And so when we come upon those things, also have those helpful things, knowing the community you in, where are some other helpful things they can get as well as, you know, what you're giving. Because when they walk away, what's there is a 24 hour hotline. Maybe they're feeling, you know, suicidal, or whatever. Having some other helpful hints always there so that they also go away with something and they don't just kind of drop the ball on you and think, okay, you're going to solve every problem, but get them engaged so that it is a two-way street. They're doing, and as one, my a professor once told me, in the beginning, you're going to look like you're doing 90% and they're doing 10. And we're going to get them eventually so that they are doing the 90 and we're doing less to help them engage and to do those things that, you know, they've never had the tools they needed. But now you as professionals are going to provide them with the tools that they need. So I think that'll be helpful too. Yeah, thank you, Shanita, for that addition. Um, great advice from your professor. <laughs> All right, so the uh, next question, um, so we've talked about the challenge. Now, what's the most exciting or important part of what you do? Basically, what keeps you working in this helping and counseling field? Um, so we'll go ahead and same thing. Anyone who feels so inclined, feel free to start. I'll go ahead and start uh, with that, you know, um, What's very rewarding to me, you know, um, is to see them get to that point where they are, you know, at that 90 percent. They're uh, making that progress on their own, right? And so um, as I let my clients know that, you know, therapy isn't forever, you know, it's going to vary from client to client. Um, However, the goal is for them to, uh, for therapy to come to a conclusion, though, right? And so it's it's very um, rewarding again to me when I'm seeing, okay, they're making this progress, and then realize, oh, okay, I don't need to uh, come to therapy as much, or maybe I can just go once a month, or I can just do a check-in, or you know. How, call you when I need to call you maybe it's 
six months from now, maybe it's a year from now, maybe I'm good for life, you know. So just seeing that progress. Is I call helpful. that maintenance therapy. Yes, yes. can go ahead. Um, so for me with um, Caleb, I'm in higher education for, for reference, but um, the most exciting thing and rewarding thing for me is really just forming those relationships with my students where they feel comfortable coming to me for things they're struggling with all the way to even just celebrating their wins um, and being excited to share that with you and excited for the future. Um, yes. And yes, and then just hearing um, when I get really positive feedback about students, you know, I try my best to acknowledge that they're each an individual. And obviously with thousands and thousands of students at Virginia Tech, just like University of Iowa, we're a very large university. And sometimes I think they feel that they're just a number or um, there's another student that we don't remember who they are. So I really try to be intentional with, um, even in the class I teach in the fall for first year freshmen and transfer students, I really try to be um, intentional with getting to know everyone's, at least everyone's name. And it's a very large class of 175 students, but um, it's just nice when you, the students, like, they kind of like, they get really shocked, like when I call on them and they're like, oh crap, she knows my name, like what? <laughs> so, but it's also, they, they know that it's, it's like, okay, she cares enough to try to, to recognize me as an individual. So that also makes me really, really happy. Um, I'll bounce off Emily. Um, oh, my screen is very dark. Sorry, everyone. Um, uh, I think it's the same as Caleb and Emily both said, coming from any direction, um, we could go on and on about why we do the work that we do and why we enjoy it. Um, in leadership, there's an aspect of you get to watch client journeys or like she said, student journeys, depending on where you're at, um, walking the journey with them, being part of their story. Um, and even if like I work in substance use, so we hear really great stories after the lead, they're still sober, they're going to school, they've graduated. Um, and even the stories that you hear that maybe they're still struggling, there's a piece that says maybe at some point when they're ready, this the things that I provided will come back. Um, and I planted a seed that at some point will grow and help them at some point in their life. So um, holding on to that. The other piece for me is staff. Um, we have a lot of direct care staff. I supervise therapists, um, other leadership members, um, and watching them grow because a lot of them are coming in fresh, green, um, with no experience. And so they're learning about themselves as professionals, about the client care, about the duties in general, um, and you just get to watch them grow as well. So getting the leadership portion, you get both sides and it's it's really awesome. I think the other piece for me is the complete broader picture as a social worker. Um, so when I hear people in the community being like, homelessness is really a problem, I get to think in the back of my head, like I help people every day that are suffering from homelessness. So even if there's two people right now that can say, I went to Rosecrans and they really helped me. We're helping that population, right? Um, even if it's just for a second or just in a little tiny piece. Um, so there's just multiple ways that it's fulfilling uh, the career overall. Uh, Monica or Molly, anything you want to add for this one? Sure. Um, I think the, the most exciting or important part um, would be witnessing, again, kind of echoing what everyone has said, like with witnessing that growth and transformation from clients um, and from my, my green providers. Um, being able to not only watch clients over years come in, being excited about accomplishing their goals and even if it's it's setting boundaries with someone in their life um, or seeing my providers um, who are building their caseloads and learning what to do in new situations um, and feeling more confident in themselves is a wonderful part of of my job I would just add to that, you know, the best part of my job is is when I can make a positive impact. So whether that's meeting with somebody one on one to find a creative solution for an accommodation on their job or, you know, 
this afternoon, I had the privilege of attending a City of Iowa City ADA meeting and talking about accessibility kind of from a systems perspective that's, you know, going to impact my where I live, you know, I think we can use our advocacy and our skills and our experiences to really, you know, make our communities and in our country and our state and the world a better place. And that is just such a cool thing. Yeah, absolutely, that does sound really exciting. Okay, so uh, obviously there's a lot that can go into um, these type of careers, but what are some key skills, qualities, or experiences that students could work toward to help them be successful in a helping or counseling role? Um, and we'll go ahead and how about we start with Molly? Absolutely. Yeah, key skills. Um, I mean, from a from a therapy perspective, right, that act of listening, empathy, communication, um, which you learn throughout your program, um, experiences, any sort of internships you can grab. I know in the therapy world, um, especially in the state of Iowa, it can get a little interesting because a lot of the therapy stuff you have to have um, at least be in a master's program. Um, BHIS, if you work anywhere um, that has behavioral health intervention services, uh, those with a bachelor's can essentially start to practice those therapy skills. Um, BHIS work, you meet with um, kids and teens in the home, um, can go over family stuff and behaviors and all that. So that's a really good starting point. Um, but yeah, a lot of these skills you get to learn um, over time and they build over time and that coming in day one, um, you know, I, I wish someone would have told me that it's OK not to have all the answers um, and that you learn and grow over time and that never stops no matter how long we are in the in the field for. Well said, lifelong learner. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, Caleb, if you want to join in. Oh, I think you might be muted. Sorry. Yes, yes, yeah. Everyone can hear me OK. OK, again, um, the question one more time, please. So I'm not writing these down, so. No, no, you're so good. Um, <laughs> So some key skills, qualities, or experiences that students could be working towards to help them um, be successful for um, starting out and helping in counseling roles. Yeah, uh, well, Molly had mentioned the BHS, and I actually had started uh, through BHS uh, myself. And so it is a um, definitely way to get in there, um, you know, as, as well as having the support of supervisors and other uh, therapists that, you know, that you will meet with and get those skills and, and get that help. And so I think it's a great way. Um, but it's also uh, provides diversity because what that does is it, uh, allows you to enter into a world that maybe you have never seen before. And that could be in the area of abuse. Maybe children are dealing with abuse. You know, maybe you never experienced that before in your own personal life, you know. And so, again, um, that also helps. One of the things that I, looking back now, uh, I've learned uh, never to judge, and this gets uh, pretty uh, deep here, uh, very sensitive, but, you know, um, if we look at the individual um, who is very promiscuous, many times from the outside, we'll just see that this person is very promiscuous, but now being a therapist, for some time now, I'm able to go back and ask those questions and find out what the root is, right? Uh, and many times 
uh, and, and I believe that this also helps because I was also a school counselor before I was a mental health counselor. And so many times teachers, you know, some of you on here are therapists and social workers, you're used to dealing with the root, whereas maybe the teacher will see, okay, you know, little Johnny's coming in, he's acting up, he's fighting, he's, you know, being a bully, you know. Uh, and so he's just punished for that behavior and not um, really mentored and uh, there's not a many times in-depth conversations about, hey, what is really going on? Um, and that's something that we do as therapists and psychologists and social workers and some of you are on this counseling call to help figure out, you know, he may be uh, being bullied because he didn't get breakfast, you know, because um, there's no food in the house. So when he goes to school and he's being a bully and he's stealing somebody else's food, he just gets in trouble for stealing someone else's food. Not really knowing that the root cause is Oh, he's stealing someone else's food and he's being a bully because he's not getting breakfast at home because his parents can't afford it. So, um, again, just as Molly said, you know, getting into BS gives that opportunity. And so, really, part of those skills is um, getting into some of these agencies and finding out uh, other perspectives and uh, some of the other concerns that really varies from depression to anxiety, um, family issues, low self-esteem. And so um, I would say having those students get involved and uh, finding out and then it will give them a chance to see, you know, is this really for them, right? And I think BS is a way, and that's um, one of the ways that I really learned that, hey, I can do this. I like doing this. I like being a help. And it started out with BS, so. All right, thank you so much. I do want to make sure we get to our last question before we open it for Q&A. So just want to um, quickly, before moving on to that, um, if anyone else wants to mention skills, qualities, experiences? I echo what everyone said. Um, I think also patience is a big one. And for my role in higher education, and I'm sure that you see this with clients um, as well in the therapy side of things, but people don't know what they don't know. And so that's, I think, a really big thing I have to keep in mind just because I have to know something. I have to kind of put myself in the shoes of the students, be like, would I have known that at that age? And also just times have changed as well. I will add too, if I could just plug a few experiences, um, AmeriCorps service, Big Brothers Big Sisters, work as a direct care professional, work as a job coach, join student committees, get involved in your community. Um, I wrote, earn some street cred. Just everything, anything that you can do to get a range of experiences um, is going to help you. Um, never miss an opportunity to learn, to grow, and to ask questions. And then write thank you notes. If you really enjoyed a volunteer experience or had a good conversation with somebody, um, send them a note afterwards. And, and don't be afraid to reach out to like the director or supervisor of an organization or an agency or whatever um, and ask them questions because they would probably love to hear from you. Um, I'll also mimic what everybody else has said, but I think the most important part of this question for brand new people coming in is um, one of the best skills is to let your ego drop. Um, when we first come into the field, it's really easy to say, oh, I'm not going to ask a question because what if I sound stupid or I was supposed to learn that in school or I'll just pretend I know what I'm doing. And then once I find out, I'll, you know, never be afraid to ask questions. Jump right into stuff. Let people know if you don't know. Um, like Emily said, our clients only know what they know. 
You only know what you know. And we also have that same expectation. So if we go into a field, it doesn't make sense for people to think we know everything about it or that we think we do. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be stubborn. Don't let your ego get in the way. And then um, the other one I had was volunteering, which kind of goes with Monica's. Um, if there's not a job that you can jump into, volunteer somewhere. Um, that's maybe serving a population that later you would work with or um, something like that. There's a million opportunities for that. And also shout out to Be His because that is also how I started. So I'm glad that that came up. <laughs> Can I just add one thing? You brought something. Someone said, and I wasn't, you know, seeing who's on the panel speaking, but one of the things that we learned a long time ago is there's no such thing as a dumb question. The only dumb question is the one that you don't ask. Okay. I kind of, um, that's something that, you know, teachers taught us a long time ago. And at the same time, you know, as we say, we don't come with a preconceived idea. We talk about the uh, blank slate. I let you write your story for me. I don't write a story for you. And just be in that listening ear. Sometimes just to listen, good eye contact, all those things you guys learn to do so that the particular client, patient know that you are, you know, directly, you have their full attention. And I think that's so important because when they know that someone is listening, they're more willing to talk, they actually go even deeper than what they would their regular doctor or someone else they may go to see. But when they know that you care, they're gonna look for they're gonna look to you. And that's a big responsibility that's in good. itself. And to know that, you know, you're there for them. And as long as they know that there's a lifeline there, they're gonna keep coming back. And I did substance abuse as well for about 15 years or better, but um, you know, for counseling. And um, it makes a difference. Case management, counseling, the whole works. And there's always, you know, like I say, keep a Rolodex, however you keep it these days, of information, people of contacts, whether it's getting free, whatever, or, you know, help with whatever. Um, have those things so that, you know, you build your own little portfolio of things you can get to and help your clients. So just wanted to add that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. No, definitely appreciate that. Um, so I do have one final question. I think I will um, wait just a moment and open it up for if anybody in the audience wants to ask a question. And then if we um, still have time, then we'll get to that question. Um, so yeah, everyone, there is a, again, Q&A feature if you want to put a question in there and we can ask it to the panel. Um, but in the meantime, while you might be chatting away, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for these thoughtful responses, for your time here. Um, I know that I, like, I'm already in my full-time profession. I went to grad school for higher ed and student affairs. So like I'm in it, but I feel re-inspired and wish like that I could like go out and be starting my job process. Like you all are just very, uh, very inspiring very much appreciate you being here um so with that we'll go ahead and take a look and see if there are any questions okay um first question so as someone thinking about getting my master's in social work what piece of advice would you give and again anyone feel free to jump in you don't all have to answer but if you have advice please please jump in um i'll jump into this one um, when I was thinking about social work and went to get my master's in social work, the most important thing that I got was in my practicums and the experiences that I had to take, um, I worked both with micro level work and macro level work um, because those are two very different sometimes areas and different job requirements and duties. Um, and so make sure that you get experience in the entire spectrum of that because you might think I really want to be a therapist so I'm just going to go shadow someone for therapy so I can learn that and then that might not be the area that you actually love um because that does happen a lot to people social work is so broad that make sure that you experience the broad to make sure that you know what you like Excellent advice. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? Okay, 
Well, not seeing any other questions come through yet. So we'll go ahead and go back to the question, which uh, funny enough is basically um, the question that was just asked. So now you get to answer it, um, which is knowing that students are in a similar position to where you might have been when you were first embarking on your career. What is um, a piece of advice that you would have for them or maybe something you wish you would have known when you first started out? And anyone can jump in. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I can go. Um, so if you are looking into higher education, whether that's a master's program, PhD, PsyD, all of that, really put time into the research into the program itself, um, into their requirements. Not that you wouldn't do that anyway, um, but I wish I wouldn't have spent the money and the time and the stress on taking my GRE um, because I didn't end up needing it. Um, so it's one of those like those little things of just really spending time looking into the programs that you might want to apply for. Um, your networking at that stage is going to be a huge tool. So email the clinical directors or email the program directors, send those thank yous if you get invited to an on campus interview. Um, those are going to be ways where they are noticing that you are interacting. It's what you want. Um, so yeah, really, really spend some time and, and reflect and research, um, but also network into the programs that you are really interested in. Caleb, do you want to go? I see your mic's off. Otherwise, I can go. Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, I would say uh, it's important for students to really think about what life looks like when you're in the field. OK, and so for me being a mental health therapist, one of the things that was difficult, uh, depending on where you're working at, um, again, I started with BHIS and then went to um, an agency that actually had the BHIS. So, it was, you know, um, all kind of tied in together. But when I began working for a private practice, um, those clients weren't just there. You know, they weren't waiting. So, you know, again, this is just my area, uh, but you have to realize that it may not start all the way. <laughs> so you may think that, OK, I've got my degree and I'm, you know, I'm ready to go out and start practicing and then you're waiting, you know, and sometimes it can be like crickets like, oh, well, you know, this here's this big practice <laughs> that I thought the clients <laughs> would just kind of be there and and waiting and, you know, and you kind of base it off, you know, and again, um, everybody's a little bit different, you know, some people do a 50-50 split, some people do a 60-40 split, and, you know, and so on and so forth. But keeping that in mind, again, depending um, where you're at, because some agencies are like, yeah, you know, we've got clients, but you're going to work eight hours a day. Whereas private practice is kind of like, oh, you get your own schedule, but <laughs> you can have to build your own clients and so yeah just because you go in and work for another big practice does it mean that they have clients to spread around to you and so that's one of the things that i realized going in and it took me a while um because so start thinking about how you can start building your networks and letting people know hey, i'm going into you know mental health uh therapy and letting uh, people know and building those connections. So when you arrive to that point, you know, maybe you have uh, some clientele or you know how to build enough, you know, even nowadays social media presence to get people ready to follow you and you know, contact you because even as a temporary licensed mental health therapist, you know, it's all on you 
for the most part. And again, that depends from what agency that you're working with. Can I throw something in? Uh, yeah, I was going to we... say, oh, yeah, please. I was going to mention to any of you if you wanted to add something real quick before we wrap up. Please. Yeah, I wanted to throw in um, two things that I think are important. So one of them is that while you're in school, bachelor's or master's, you're going to hear if you're in a helping profession, you should get a therapist. You should see someone um, personally so that you can take care of yourself. I do actually think that's super important. Um, and as a student, you think, oh, I'm fine, right? I'm getting a master's degree or I'm getting a bachelor's degree. It's not going to be a problem. Um, and it is really difficult work sometimes. So especially starting off, I think that's an important thing to do is set up maybe your own counseling or therapy and it's there in case you need it because it does get difficult even when you're not expecting it. Um, the other thing I didn't think about until I got into some uh, risky situations at work or dangerous situations is don't ignore um, safety protocols at any agencies that you're at. Um, don't underestimate clients because we become trusting with them and that's not to say anything bad about clients but depending on the situation you're in there can be dangerous situations. Um, as simple as we talked about be his, you know, where do you place yourself in someone's home if you're doing in homework? Where's the door? Um, you know, how do you contact someone if there's an emergency or you're in danger? Um, I work residential right now. We have to learn how to physically restrain people. There's lots of safety protocols. So not to scare anyone um, into the field, but it's definitely an important thing to know. Bye, Monica. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think that's that's a great point you bring up. Um, and I actually at, at my work, we actually have emergency buttons under our desk that contact the Virginia Tech police. So, um, you know, even thinking about that. Yeah, you don't want to put yourself in a potentially dangerous or, or negative situation. Um, so, yeah, very interesting. Um, I think my two things that come to mind that I wish someone would have told me are. Oh, Caleb, do you have to go too? No, no, we're good. I was just. No. Oh, OK. No, I just heard something. Once you get yeah. done, I think she has some. She may want oh, to add. Oh, no worries, people. no worries. Um, I wish someone would have told me that your bachelor's degree does not determine your life path. Um, and I think nowadays, especially in more like the millennial Gen Z generations, depending on the job, of course. What we're seeing is certain jobs may not even care what your bachelor's degree is in. What employers are more looking for are your experiences, your relationship building, the skills you have, your, you know, adhering to ethics. And a lot of career panels that I've sat on, you know, they say we're looking for, you know, how these people are, how they are as a person, how they can inter interact with our customers and clients. We don't necessarily, depending on the job, care about what their bachelor's is in, right? We can teach them the things that need to be taught. So in the School of Neuroscience, we have a lot of students come in saying that, you know, I am pre-med or I am going to go into research. Otherwise, my neuroscience degree is useless. But we have students all across the board that do um, pharmaceutical sales, marketing. We even have a student that graduated in 2022 who works at TikTok now as a content strategy specialist. So he did computational and systems neuroscience with a digital marketing minor. So he's using more actually of his minor knowledge um, than what his bachelor's was in. So I think um, we're seeing that trend a lot more um, and people are changing careers and, you know, going different pathways a little bit more rather than, you know, back when my parents, you know, were in school and in work, you know, it's not like you get your degree, you stay at the same engineering firm for 45 years and then you retire. So people are also doing different things and going different paths and that's okay. Um, your degrees don't determine where you will end up. Um, something I wish someone else also told me, I knew going into higher education that, um, Obviously, we're not going to be making as much as our engineering counterparts salary wise. You know, there are engineering students that graduate here that make double what I make now. Um, but really being OK with the fact that, you know, I think so, some institutions are doing better in terms of in the higher ed world, at least of pay and recognizing the value of higher education professionals. But this isn't and you know other people can chime in on the more therapy counseling side this isn't really a profession that you know I, you don't anticipate making a lot of money so if you're looking at things like um graduate programs uh you know furthering your education also thinking about the cost of it i was very fortunate in my graduate program a lot of masters in higher education programs are um the tuition is offset if you serve as a graduate assistant so i didn't pay for my master's degree but depending, I know Molly mentioned like a side year earlier, 
to my understanding, CIDs are quite a bit of money because you're not funded as a P as opposed to a PhD student, you know, so there's a lot of nitty gritty. So I would also just really think about the cost and the amount of loans you're going to take out. And if you need to take those out and, you know, kind of just saying, I will be okay with that. But I understand that this is something that can potentially affect me in the future. Like I am still paying off my student loans from undergrad. Um, and just, yeah, being comfortable with the salary having you have and making it fit with your lifestyle doesn't mean you shouldn't advocate for yourself, obviously, to get a higher salary, but um, highly doubt you're going to make uh, 80K coming into this, <laughs> this role um, right after you graduate. My first job out of my master's was 38000 for reference. So granted, the economy is different now and times have changed, but um, just with some perspective. Well, even on that too, Emily, Coming into if like the counseling or therapy world is your path, also once upon, you know, when you're looking to graduate, look into counties and communities that offer student loan forgiveness. Um, there are multiple counties within Iowa alone um, where if you put in two years at this particular location, it's usually a little bit more high need. Um, so, you know, be aware of that. But putting in two years, you know, your loan forgiveness can be anywhere between, you know, fifty to sixty thousand dollars for loan forgiveness. So look into that as well as you prepare to enter the field. Yes, yeah. that's a great point. Thank you. So looking into those options. Um, if anyone needs to drop off, totally understand. I know we're supposed to stop at eight, or I mean, I saw four oh eight, so I said eight four o'clock. Um, Shanita, if you want to add something real quick, um, then otherwise we'll wrap it's up. Real quick, it was something that um, someone said early in regards to, you know, going into different places and safety. Um, mm -hmm. We always say safety first. That's number one. I can remember going into some of the hotel, like Iowa Landing or a hotel, whatever it was, and knowing where the exits and those sorts of things, because you don't know. And we have those buttons, too, that we press for security and those kind of things. But at the same time, just being aware of your surroundings. Well, like I say, I'll do a quick surround uh, working for the uh, state of Iowa as well with, with criminology and, and criminology and those sorts of things just being aware of your surroundings and like you say you may have a patient that's very nice they may be having a bad day um i've had patients who have stepped down from a semi after having a nice long talk and was gone and it's like right there on you know interstate 380 and so those things do happen but know that it's not nothing that you and never take it personally I want to encourage that because people are always going to do what they want to do at the end of the day. You're there as a helper. And, you know, as someone said, the salaries, we didn't get into it for the salaries. We got into it because we love people and we want to help people. Okay. I just happened to wear two hats, but I, I get that part. Of it too. It's about people and loving to help people and having a passion and compassion for others. Absolutely, um, which is why this is our helping and counseling uh, industry insights. Thank you again so much, everyone, for being here. Um, our attendees, thank you for uh, joining us and listening today. Um, I know Monica already dropped off, but Monica, Emily, Avery, Molly, um, Caleb, and Shanita, thank you so much for your insights. Um, very, very appreciated. And this was um, just a great event to have you all. So thank you again, um, and you all are free to leave.